Okay, so now we're going to talk about English colonization of North America, which begins in around 1584. Sir Walter Raleigh discovers, we'll say discovers, an area near uh, North Carolina called we call today Roanoke Island. The natives there seem friendly. And so he says, this would be a good place to start a colony. Three years later, 117 colonists arrive under the leadership of John White. And this is probably just as good a time as any to, to mention here, um, language in history, right? Uh, and so I'm using this word of 117 colonists, but if you're Native Americans, you're not see colonists as being the proper word, but invaders, right? Um, if all of a sudden Martians came and started landing in Texas and uh, just taking over land, we wouldn't go, oh, look, they're colonized. They're nice colonists. We would claim they were invaders. So just to make sure that we know that that word uh, is, is certainly suspect. So 117 colonists slash invaders arrive under the leadership of John White. Now, um, White leaves uh, a year later. He said, look, I'm going back to England. I'm going to get supplies. And, and by the way, these guys had it right. I mean, they, they brought a blacksmith. They brought carpenters. Uh, they had brought seed to grow crops. But unfortunately, the ship that had the seed had hit rocks and salt water got into it, thus destroying the seed. Um, and so when White leaves, he's delayed because he thinks he's going to be back really quick. But the Spanish Armada and the war with Spain had slowed him up. When he finally returns to the colony, it's disappeared. Um, and it's often called the lost colony of Roanoke. Um, pretty much there's a lot of myth around it. Um, they had they had traded heavily with the natives. Uh, eventually, maybe that ran out. There had been harsh uh, relations. Uh, they did find a few skeletons, but they also figured that a lot of them just moved to other places and then died out. And they're still looking for clues. In fact, I think recently there was a uh, a, a dig uh, somewhere. They were doing some archaeological research. May have found clues of some of these colonists trying to set up someplace else. Well. Uh, in 1603, Elizabeth dies, and she was, of course, childless. And James I, son of Mary, becomes uh, king, which begins the so-called Stuart dynasty. And it's during James's reign that most of the 13 colonies, or at least the Stuart dynasty colonies, were founded. These colonies are going to be very diverse in geography, motives, composition. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide variety, and we'll go through the different varieties of colonies. In 1606, England makes peace with Spain. Well, this is great because this means that they have more men for uh, colonization, invasion, and exploration. So King James chartered what he called, or they called the Virginia Company. Now this is what we call a joint stock colony that they're going to create. The idea is that you get stockholders to invest in your uh, colony. And in return, they're expecting gold or products like wine, tar, fruits, olive oil, some sort of uh, sellable good, retail good or maybe even uh, the mythical Northwest Passage to Asia. In fact, when you hear today about, um, you'll hear the term, uh, he's a venture capitalist. That's the shorter version of adventure capitalists, which is who these people were called or what they were called. They were adventure capitalists. They were out there looking for adventure and to make money. So their first colony is gonna be Virginia, named after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. It's um, founded on May 6, 1607, when three ships loaded with 100 men reached the Chesapeake Bay, uh, and they sail up the, a river they named the James River. Now, they sail up the river about 40 miles because they want to have a, an outpost, but if it's along the coast, it could be attacked by the Spanish, and they didn't want that. Now, they did not plan this well at all. They didn't have all the skilled people that they needed uh, for Jamestown, which is what they're going to call this place. That's probably the most important uh, settlement for the future of the United States. They came to look for gold, not to farm. They weren't sure how to exploit the local game. And supplies uh, from England uh, were unreliable. And if you've been to Jamestown, and you can, um, they, they still do work there at Jamestown, uh, it was a bad place. The water was brackish, so fresh water a little bit more difficult. And of course, it was just a, a haven for mosquitoes. Uh, and so disease was a problem. So their trade depended on, uh, their, their livelihood depended on trade with the natives, and the, the leader of the natives was Powhatan. 
he had gained control over about 30 tribes and he had hoped to use the English to expand his power. He said, well, these are important allies. They've got weapons. Uh, maybe I can get more power. He realized too late that the English wanted to subjugate the natives. They weren't really there to become allies. Now, one of the leaders of the colonists was a man by the name of Captain John Smith, who was a swashbuckler. He was an adventurer. He had been everywhere, uh, all around the world. And with the colonists on the verge of starvation, Smith imposed harsh discipline and forced uh, all to labor. He, his famous saying was, he that will not work uh, will not eat. And there were there's probably at least a third of the people there who considered themselves blue buds that didn't have to work. They felt like, I just have to work. I'm not a, no, I don't work with my hands. It's for the common folk to do. Smith also bargained with the natives, uh, mapped the Chesapeake region. Part of it, he was looking for that lost tribe of Roanoke. Um, and through his efforts, Jamestown survives. In 1609, Smith returns to England after suffering uh, powder burns in, a, in an attack. And once he's gone, anarchy ensues. Uh, Jamestown had reached a population of over 300. Famine hits Jamestown in 1610. Uh, and when finally in May of 1610, uh, a relief party finds only 60 people left alive. All the poultry, all the livestock, the horses, dogs had been eaten. One man supposedly uh, murdered and ate his wife. Um, for the next seven years, the colony sort of just limps along, not knowing if it's going to make it. But in 1612, a man by the name of John Rolfe introduces tobacco. And by 1615, it becomes an export staple. Uh, it's able to be sent back uh, to England, which James I refers to as that stinking weed, uh, and thought that smoking was unhealthy for you even back then. Rolfe uh, Roth will ma uh, marry Pocahontas, the daughter of Powhatan. Uh, now, you've probably seen the Disney version of all of, of uh, Pocahontas, which is, uh, I know this is going to be shocking, not historically correct with talking trees and raccoons. Uh, and we all know that John Smith said, he told a story that Pocahontas had saved his life when he was about to be executed. A story that, once again, when you look at history, you have to see with some suspect because he really doesn't tell the story until after she becomes famous. And he had told a similar story of being saved by a, a daughter of a member of the royalty when he was a prisoner in a Turkish prison. So, you know, John Smith, eh, we'll, we'll wonder about that. But Rolf does marry Pocahontas and takes her to London, which was probably a mistake because London's a cesspool of disease. And she dies a horrible death in 1620 of smallpox. All right, so we need to know that uh, the year 1619 is one of the most important years, uh, I think, uh, for the, um, the American colonies. One, uh, they begin the so-called uh, headright policy, which means that you got, if you could pay your way over to the new world, you got 50 acres and you got 50 acres more for any servant that you brought. So you could actually own land. That was almost impossible when you think about it uh, in England, all the land was owned by the nobility. It was all taken up. But in America, you could own land. Um, so an extra 50 acres, great. Also in 1619, the first Virginia General Assembly met. Um, in other words, you're going to have a legislature. And so early on by 1619, the Americans are, are used to this idea of ruling themselves, governing themselves. And that makes it tougher on the British 100 years from now uh, when they're trying to gain control over the colonies. Also in 1619, uh, 90 young maidens arrived. Uh, this was important. Uh, there was a shortage of women. You needed women to uh, keep the colony going. Uh, and you could, uh, the women would be sold to the husband. The women got to choose their husbands just for the cost of transportation, about 125 pounds of tobacco. And it's interesting to note that, you know, if your husband died, your job wasn't to be in mourning very long. It was to remarry because the primary job was to produce children so that the, the colony could survive. Also in 1619, a Dutch ship drops off the first, um, the first Africans to an English colony. Now, who, the, who were these Africans? Were they slaves or were they what we call indentured servants? There is some evidence they were indentured servants. We'll talk about indentured servants here again shortly. 
but indentured servants were people that were, you would be taken to the new world uh, and you would work for somebody until you paid off your debt uh, of the transportation cost. And, and then you would get land for yourself. It sounds like a good deal, but most of the time indentured servants died before they ever got their land. And if you were a woman and you were an indentured servant and you were pregnant, uh, then your child would be born as an indentured servant. So by 1619, we're seeing Africans in the United States. And so um, right from the very beginning. In 1622, John Rolfe is killed in an Indian attack. He's dead now. And in 1624, Virginia becomes another type of colony, what we call a royal colony. A royal colony is one that's owned by the king or queen. Uh, the reason for that is, is that the joint stock co colony that founded Virginia became bankrupt and had to be taken over. The next colony we want to talk about is Maryland. In 1634, Maryland appears on the northern shores of the Chesapeake. It's the first what we call proprietary colonies, not granted to a company, but to an individual. In this case, the Lord Baltimore. In 1625, uh, George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore, became a Catholic. And so he says, look, being a Catholic in Protestant England, tough to do. So I'm going to establish a colony in the New World as a refuge for English Catholics. And so he goes to the king and says, I'd like to have the grant of land to start a place for English Catholics. So we'll be out of your hair. You won't persecute us. Probably a lot of us will die over uh, in, the, in the New World. The charter is issued in 1632. And you might say, well, hooray for George Calvert. But he had died uh, already. But his son, the second Lord of Baltimore, will found a colony at a place called St. Mary's, lo lo located on a small stream near the mouth of the Potomac. Now, when you got a colony, you had a charter. The charter was how it was going to set out. It's much like a constitution. The charter gave the Lord Baltimore the power to uh, pass laws with the consent of freemen. Freemen were the property owners. Um, you had the first legislature meet in 1635. It's bicameral, meaning two houses. And the charter also allowed the uh, Lord Baltimore to grant huge estates, which didn't really work well uh, here because people could just go somewhere else and find some of their own land. Uh, you, you didn't get a lot of rich people wanting to come over. So the Lord Baltimore says, all right, I'm gonna have to um, offer land to anybody that can come over, uh, adopt a headright system. And originally they were gonna farm, but then they turned to tobacco. So that brings us to the New England colonies. Uh, now the New England colonies, um, we're, here we're talking about uh, Connecticut, um, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine. Maine is part of, um, uh, and New Hampshire, Maine is part of Massachusetts up at this time, up until 1820. Uh, you probably know about Plymouth, which was founded by pilgrims. Pilgrims are separatists. They didn't want to be part of the Church of England. They wanted to create a Christian commonwealth. Well, they had been persecuted by James I because they wanted, uh, because of their new church form of government, which really sort of challenged his belief in absolute royal power. They said the king doesn't have power over the church. They had fled to Holland in 1607. But they faced discrimination in Holland. They also feared their children were becoming way too Dutch, um, I guess because they were growing tulips and stuff like that. They wanted to return home because they were English, but they feared more prosecution. Prosecution, persecution. So they come up with this idea, they, they ask the king, they go, look, what if you guys have a colony in the new world where we could be left alone? And on the plus side, most of us will die. And the king says, okay, you can have a colony in the new world. And so in September of 1620, led by William Bradford, 100 men, women, and children aboard the Mayflower, about half of them are pilgrims. They landed a place called Cape Cod, mainly because uh, cod was a very popular fish in the area. In fact, there's a really good book uh, called Cod, the Fish That Changed the World. Don't ask me who wrote it, but I read it, it's really good. And in November 21st of 1620, 41 pilgrims create the cult, men pilgrims, no women, create what they call the Mayflower Compact. It's a formal agreement by the pilgrims to abide by the laws made by leaders of their own choosing. And this establishes this idea of, of government by consent, right? That we'll choose our own leaders, but they're not gonna be appointed. So this also should point out here too, that when they're establishing these colonies, one of the great myths in American history is this idea um, that that we were founded on the idea of freedom of religion. No, um, the, the different groups that settle here, when they talk about freedom of religion, they're talking about freedom of religion for themselves. They'll persecute Baptists, they'll persecute Quakers, they will persecute other people. 
Well, that first winter, because if you think about it, right, um, the, uh, the pilgrims left in 1620 because they were in September of 1620 because they were delayed. That means you're hitting the new world in the winter. So about half the pilgrims die in the winter. Now get this sentence. In spring of 1521, pilgrims meet a friendly native by the name of Squanto who shows them how to grow maize and this saves the colony. Now, this is how we can reverse that sentence, right? 1621, the pilgrims meet Squanto, uh, if you're the native Americans, a trader who showed the invaders how to survive and take hold of their land. So as you can see, uh, it depends on who's writing the history. Now they, they celebrate and hold a harvest feast that would later be called Thanksgiving, but keep in mind that Thanksgivings are uh, fairly frequent in American history. George Washington had said, we need to give Thanksgiving for the constitution. And they had his holiday for that as well. Now, in Massachusetts Bay, away from Cape Cod, these people uh, that are going to settle here are what we call uh, Puritans uh, or Congregationalists who wanted self-governing churches, whose members would be limited to what they call visible saints. In other words, those who could demonstrate the receipt of God's gift of grace, that they were going to be um, uh, predestined to go to heaven. Uh, and these people do not tolerate challenging uh, their religious authority. Uh, in 1629, King Charles I grants them land north of the uh, Plymouth Colony for settlement by the Massachusetts Bay Company. They're led by a respected lawyer by the name of John Winthrop. Now you got a lawyer handy um, and he's gonna create this, this place for a, uh, as a haven for persecuted Puritans. Remember Puritans wanna purify the Church of England. Um, lawyers find loopholes and he finds a loophole. Usually in a charter it said you had to keep the charter in England so that the king could change it anytime he wanted to. But that wasn't in this charter. So Winthrop says, yoink, we're taking the charter with us. And that means that they can't be changed because the Puritans have the charter and therefore Puritan control. In 1630, they take a ship to the new world. Winthrop uh, gives one of his most famous, one of the most famous speeches uh, when they get off the ship, where he argues that the United, this, this new colony should be considered a city upon a hill. Uh, a shining beacon to other places. The idea is that um, the United States was going to be the moral example of how to uh, how to uh, run a government. And you, you'll still see that theme. Uh, presidents will use the city upon the hill theme often. Reagan did it. Uh, George Bush Sr. did his thousand points of light, that beacon of light on the city, of, city upon the hill. It's, it's a goal that they aim for, but um, again, the reality in American history comes up short, but it's still something that inspires America. By the end of 1630, about 17 ships arrive, a thousand co colonists, invaders, whatever, uh, arrive. Boston becomes the capital. This begins the so-called Great Migration. Uh, we've had several in American histories. Uh, 40 to 50,000 Englishmen flee to the New World. Uh, in, 60, uh, in about a decade. In 1644, Massachusetts will develop a government with a bicameral legislature elected by the voters. Uh, voters used to be only churchgoers, but now property owners can do as well. But not all is well in Massachusetts. Like I said, Puritans um, don't like other religions. Um, if you've ever been to Boston, there's a place called Boston Commons, which is a huge park. Uh, Boston Commons is a place where also where they used to hang Quakers for their beliefs. So let's talk about some of the dissent. One of them is Roger Williams. Roger Williams wanted a complete break with the Church of England and have no relations with the English government or the Anglican Church, or even those who were unsaved, who didn't have that grace of uh, God's divine uh, blessing of going to heaven. He eventually came to believe that really the only true church was that was possible if he and maybe his wife maybe had doubts about it, others. And he believed in the separation of church and state. Well, uh, this doesn't play well with the Puritans. Uh, they banish him. They said, we're going to banish you to England. But he escapes and starts his own settlement, uh, now known as Providence, Rhode Island. And that will become the colony of Rhode Island. It's the first colony to uh, legislate uh, freedom of religion for everyone. Now, another troublemaker for them will be Anne Hutchinson. She's articulate, strong-willed, intelligent. She's the wife of a prominent merchant. She had raised 13 children. And she would hold meetings in her Boston homes to discuss sermons. 
Soon she started providing her own commentaries on religious matters, right? Saying, well, let me tell you what the minister was saying here. Uh, and let me show you, tell you what he was trying to say. Then she later claimed that she had a, de a direct revelation from God. Um, and God told her that only one or two Puritan preachers preach the truth. And that God also told her that good works could lead to salvation. Well, this conflicted with the Puritan of uh, doctrine of predestination. And also, according to Puritan theology, only a minister could interpret the will of God. And probably her biggest sin was she was a woman, right? Talking about religious matters. She tried for heresy in 1637. She's banished in 1638 as a woman not fit for our society. She went to Providence and then settled on an island near Portsmouth. She was pregnant at the time, but the baby was stillborn, and critics said it was God's punishment. In 1642, she moves to Long Island. 1643, she and five of her children are massacred uh, in an Indian attack, and John Winthrop calls it divine justice. By the way, you can see Winthrop's grave uh, in Boston. It's right next to an Anglican church and right next to a ventilation shaft for the um, um, Boston subway. Uh, not going to say a lot about Connecticut, Maine, and New Hampshire, also uh, uh, founded by Puritans looking for better access um, to the fur trade and better lands um, and uh, protection against Indian attack. In fact, there is the Pequot War in which um, Puritans wipe out 400 men, women, and children um, during the Pequot, Pequot War. But that's all we're going to say about those three colonies. Uh, now, it's interesting to note, and I'm going to, we'll talk about this again a little bit later, but for the Puritans, if you believe in predestination, then you, you had to have certain signs, right? That you were, that you had been chosen by God. You had to be devoutly more, uh, moral, right? Church attendance. Uh, and you can also look at the sign is that you were uh, successful in business, right? Uh, obviously, if you're successful in business, it means that God has shown favor upon you and that uh, you're one of the, the chosen. But imagine you're a Puritan, right? And you're doing all the things that you need to do. You're li living the godly life and uh, being moral and you have a successful farm and then lightning hits your uh, farmhouse and burns it down. Well, your neighbors think, okay, obviously you're not one of the chosen because why would God allow that to happen? Or if your child was killed or if your, 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 your crop failed, all these things will be that so-called Puritan dilemma where Puritans are thinking, wait, my crops failed, but I've been doing everything right. Am I no longer one of the chosen? I'm, was I ever one of the chosen? Am I not going to heaven? And so for the Puritans, this is always a struggle. Um, after 1640 though, uh, settlement in this area settled, uh, slows down because parliament uh, and the king are at war. Uh, Charles I is at war with his, par uh, with his parliament. Uh, Charles I loses the English Civil War uh, and is beheaded uh, by a Puritan by the name of Oliver Cromwell, who will uh, run England as a Puritan commonwealth for some time. But by 1660, uh, the, the English are tired of the Puritans ruling them and uh, their severe uh, moral doctrines. And they invite Charles II, Charles I's son, to come back home from France and, and lead them. Interestingly enough, Charles II is... Um, uh, very bitter, obviously. And so he digs up Oliver Cromwell's dead body, beheads him, puts his head on a spike, and then drags his dead body around London for three days on the back of a horse. So we're going to leave it there. Uh, we're going to next talk up about the Carolinas uh, and uh, the middle colonies in Georgia. So we'll stop there. Next time, uh, more colonies. <laughs>